I'm reminded of a uh, story that Reshma likes to tell. It's about a little boy who one day he came into the house and his mother was watching Christian TV. And this little boy had asked his parents time after time after time for a bicycle. And they said, we can't right now, honey. We, we, we just can't afford that. And so he's watching Christian TV and there was a faith preacher on there and he said if you just believe God will honor your faith and so he thought on that a little bit and he thought okay he's excited and he went to bed that night and he knelt down and said Lord the preacher said if I just believe you will answer my prayer so I'm believing that you give me a bicycle and in the morning when I go out to the front of the house open the door it'll be there and he, he could hardly sleep that night he was so excited and he woke up in the morning and he jumped out of bed, ran down the stairs, opened the door, and there was no bicycle. Well, he's a little confused. He thought, well, he said if I... Mama turned on the TV again that day, listening to more teaching, and this preacher said, now you have to be very specific in your prayers. Okay. <laughs> and he thought, oh, okay. So that night he knelt down and said, Lord, I want a blue bike with nice stingray handles and you know he went through this whole litany of the stuff he wanted and, and I thank you it'll be there in the morning when I wake up he went to sleep he could already sleep again and in the morning he woke up and he ran down the stairs and no bike so he's really confused and he's a little bit hurt and he can't understand what's going on and as he's wandering around the house he sees this little statue of Mother Mary and he looked around and nobody's watching. And he grabbed that and put it in his pocket. And he ran out back into the woods and he buried that statue. And that night he knelt down to pray and he said, Now, Lord, if you want your mother back. <laughs> and that's a picture of the church as a whole. We extend faith based upon a principle that's not necessarily accurate. And when it doesn't happen the way we think God should respond to us, we become discouraged. So we listen a little bit more and get a greater formula. And we start doing the step-by-step -step program. And that doesn't happen. And finally, we get to the place where we're going to try and manipulate God to receive what it is we want from him. But I'm here to show you a better way. Every one of us has been through this process. And we finally get to a place of resignation, a lot of us, in the fact that we go, well, I don't understand how it works. I'm just going to keep doing what I know to do. And I'm just going to keep practicing and practicing in the formula. Right. And for years... We think either God's mad at us or we still have sin in our life or we don't understand the word and we're just too immature. I mean, and people encourage that in you. Well-meaning, ignorant people who reaffirm what the enemy's trying to do is to keep you under his thumb. Instead of encouraging us to wait on God. And John... 1, 12 and 13, it says this. As many as received him. How many of you have received the Lord as your Savior? So we're, we're believers in the house. We're believers online, most of us. So here's a promise to those who have received him. To them, to them he gave the right to become children. Wait, 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 wait. That's not what I was taught. I was taught the moment I accepted Jesus, I'm a child of God. Isn't that what you were taught? Yes. Then why does the word say something different? Whoever receives him has the right to become children of God. Hmm. There's got to be a clue in here. 
to those who believe in his name. Ah, what does that mean? I'm going to submit something to you today. This might shock you, but by the end you'll understand. We have taken in the name of Jesus and made a formula out of a principle. We think it's a magic wand or a magic phrase. That means God's got to respond instantly and do exactly what we tell him to do. And that is so far from the truth. And people go through this process of what I just explained about that little boy of wondering why are my prayers not answered at the moment I ask in the way I ask according to this. And, and we go through this litany of shame or anger, of rejection, of betrayal. And it's all a scheme of the devil because we've taken a principle and made a formula. God does not respond to a formulaic approach or a religious approach. He's a God of relationship, not rote. Amen? There are four major covenants in Scripture that are very telling, and we have to understand this if we're going to receive this revelation. The very first covenant is called the servant covenant, or what we know as the blood covenant. When you are born again, and the washing of the blood of Jesus brings you into the kingdom, you are now a servant of God. One thing about a servant covenant, it's the only covenant of the four major covenants that must be renewed every day. What? Yes, it's called the blood covenant. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and separated or divorced God, and he said, where are you? Well, we're hid because we're naked. And he said, who told you that? Nobody told them that. They ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before they were clothed with light as with a garment because they were created in the image of the Father and he is a being of light and he wears a garment of light. They were clothed in glory. But the moment they separated themselves from that relationship, they were now naked. Let me take that even further. If you follow the Spirit of God, you're clothed with His glory and His light. The moment you start partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and step into your own Lordship, you're naked once again. You are not the master of your life. But we're taught to be that in our cultures. Be all that you can be. Tree of knowledge. Submit to God and you are who you are called to be. Good is more deceptive than evil. I don't understand. He was a good man. Doesn't matter. Separation from God is good. Tree of knowledge of good. And evil, not just evil. Submission to God's lordship. I'm Lord of my own life. That's the difference. And we've lost sight of this because, again, culture interjects itself into our church life, our, our religious life, our relationship with God. And we hold on to things we think we know. When in truth, we don't really know what we think we know. I just gave you one verse, John 1, 12. As many as received him to them, he gave the right to become. I remember one day, Holy Spirit likes to get me in the morning because I'm not really a sparky in the morning <laughs> without some coffee. Okay, that's the dead sp that spot right there. Don't stand there. And so just as you're waking up, I, Holy Spirit, he was like sitting by the bed, just waiting. He said, who's the bride of Christ? I went. I knew it was a trick question. <laughs> so I thought for a minute, I said, well, well, Lord, my professors told me. I'm going to blame somebody else for this one. <laughs> that it's the body of Christ. He said, pick up your Bible. Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God created man in his image after his likeness. And he said, it's not right that man should be alone. So what did he do? He said, I'm going to give you a manager. He created Eve out of his side. <laughs> 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 
Guys, you ever notice you never knew how to dress, walk, talk, eat, do anything before you got married? Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> Where was I? The Holy Spirit immediately said, notice we did not clone Adam. Out of his side, the rib here closest to his heart, we took that out and we created Eve. Amen. He said, the second Adam's the same way. I went, what? I said, but Lord, you said in the mouth of two, he said, Genesis 24 before I even finished. Boom. And he showed me again. Abraham is a type of God. The father sent his eldest servant, whose name was Eliezer, which means helper or comforter back to his country, back to his family to find a bride for his wife. He said, not if we didn't bring the whole family from the family, the bride came for. And he started, I went, okay, okay, okay. I got it. But see, we receive teaching, we receive instruction from those who are repeating doctrine or tradition that they've learned rather than revelation and insight from Scripture. Now, I'm not pointing the finger at people. We've all done this. But I'm saying the Word of God is our plumb line, not the opinions of others. Amen. That's why every message you hear, and I, look, I tell this all over the world. Joe is one of the best teachers I know. I tell everybody to tune in. But that doesn't mean you take it just because he says it. Go back to the word. Everybody has that responsibility. So the first major covenant is called the blood covenant or the servant covenant. And God slew an animal and put that skin on them. The skin of the animal that he covered them with was called a katanot in Hebrew. Now that's important. Another thing about Hebraic covenants, when God initiates the first covenant and then at some point he initiates a second covenant, kind of like Old Testament, New Testament, the, the new covenant does not do away with the old. It builds upon or expands. So there's no, we don't need the Old Testament anymore. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Matter of fact, I'm convinced if we taught Bible college correctly, we'd tell each student the first semester you only get the old covenant. And from that, you must preach Christ. <laughs> Jesus himself said, Moses spoke of me. So why can't we go to back to the books of Moses and discover Christ? His word is the same. Matter of fact, every book in the new covenant came from those who taught it from the old covenant. Hmm. So God is the initiator of covenants. You're the receptor. You receive it. Now, he doesn't force it on us, does he? It's his desire that all should be saved. But not everybody responds. So the first covenant is the servant covenant. You're not a child. You're not a child of God. I'll show you. The second covenant is a, is a very interesting one. It's called the salt covenant or the covenant of friendship. Again, God's the initiator. But in Hebraic culture, if I wanted to enter into a covenant with Mark, in those days, one of the commodities that was used for exchange was salt. And so they'd have a pouch of salt, big grains of salt on their belts, and they could use that in exchange for other commodities. And so Mark and I would decide a day where we're going to enter into this transaction and we're going to come with witnesses. So he'd bring his family. I'd bring mine. And if there was anybody there, uh, 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 those who sit in the gate of the city, a witness. And then there would be a loaf of bread. There'd be a cup. There'd be a bowl. And we'd come together and solemnly we'd take some salt from each of our pouch. He put his in. I put mine in. It would be mixed up. We'd break bread, dip it in the salt and eat it. Then we would take the cup and drink. Now, all covenants had to be ratified with blood. So there would be a knife or a sword, usually a sword. He put his hand out, I put my hand out, and a sword would be placed there, double-edged, and then we'd press down and they would whoosh, slice our hands. 
And then there would be ash and other spices placed there so that there would always remain a scar. And here's why, because anybody else that would come up against Mark or I, not knowing who he was in covenant with, is the moment they saw that scar, they would go, oh, we better be careful and assess who he's in covenant with. It might be more than we can handle. The new covenant, the word of God says to lift up holy why? Jesus has a covenant with you. He has a covenant with you. A friendship covenant if you're willing to receive at the appointed time of the Father. But here's the process. That covenant is not in force until the Lord sees a measure of servanthood, trustworthiness. Somebody who's going to do what they said and follow through. And it's slowly as that develops, that servant is entrusted with a little bit more and a little bit more. And finally, the master, Adonai, my master, your master, says, let's cut another covenant. Then you become the friend of God. Now that doesn't do away with the servant covenant. Remember, Jesus, on the day before he he was crucified, knelt down and washed their feet. He was a servant till the end. Matter of fact, he was a servant by carrying the burden for all of mankind. He never moved away from that, nor do we. That's why the word teaches us to, to honor one another, to respect one another, to esteem others better than yourself. That's what a servant does. That's not a measuring stick for, well, I'm no good and I'm not worth. No, no, that's just love and a covenant that God initiated. And so they walk in that. Now you still have to renew the blood covenant every day. Well, what does that mean? Once saved, always saved. I have, you know, God forgave my sins once. I can live like the devil today and I'm still good. I know you guys don't believe that. And that's, the, that's, a, that's a deception from the pit of hell. It's this simple. When Reshma and I got married 22 years ago, we entered into a covenant. When we got our first home, she didn't come to me every day and say, is it okay if I get something out of the refrigerator to eat? Is it okay if I get a drink of water? That would have been difficult after a while. And it wasn't like, well, I told you I loved you once. That's enough. Should carry you for the rest of your life. (laughs) And I apologized once. That should be good enough forever. (laughs) That's how we treat God. That's what that doctrine says to do. So here's what renewing the blood covenant every day is. It's a relationship awareness, not a sin awareness. I want to stay in the place of relationship with God because sin separates. And so I'm quick to repent and go before the Father and say, Lord, if there's anything come between me and you, that's my fault and I want to repent. Please show me. I want relationship, not religion. Then the next covenant is the sandal covenant. Sandal covenant. Yeah, remember when the children of Israel came out of their 40 years of wilderness wandering in those rebellious shoes? When they came into the promised land, the Lord said, mark out the boundaries of your, your inheritance with those sandals. In other words, those things I brought you through in the world, in the wilderness, are going to mark out the boundaries of your eternal inheritance. Remember Moses, 40 years in the lap of luxury, 40 years on the backside of the desert pastoring, I mean, watching over sheep. (laughs) Until finally he came to a place in that wilderness called Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, the same place. Sinai is the place of visitation from God. Horeb is how you get to the top. Horeb means desolation, despair, and brokenness. He finally came to that place of brokenness. I missed everything. I missed my calling. I missed my destiny. I missed, 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 missed. And suddenly his eyes were open. 
and he sees a bush burning with fire, but it's not being consumed. He said, I've never seen anything like this. See, brokenness unlocks the spiritual vision God gave you. Pride keeps you from seeing. Brokenness opens the door so you do see. And so he heard his name twice. Moses, Moses, come here. So we have the Lord and we have an angel. Take the sandals off your feet. You're about to mark out the boundaries of your inheritance. What is it? It's holy ground. What God calls you into is holy. Your destiny is holy. We don't treat it that way. We treat it as a stepping stone to being recognized as somebody. You'll never enter into it. What was his inheritance? A nation he was going to bring out of Egypt, out of the world. His inheritance was people. Not cars, not trains, not planes, not automobiles, not houses. and People. That's the inheritance God has for you. And along the way, he might bless you with other things. But keep the main thing the main thing. Everything Jesus did and he died for was for people, not stuff. We lose sight of that. By the way, this third covenant is called inheritance covenant or sonship. Now you're a child. Hmm. I want you to see this servant. You're going to be tested and tried. Friend, you've passed a test. You stuck to it. You're now a friend of God. You have a greater measure or level of intimacy because he can entrust you more of himself. Son, the next level of intimacy. And the final one, the fourth covenant, is the bridal covenant. Back to the exact same place Adam and Eve walked away from. Intimacy. I've said it this, this play, way many times, you know, in ministry, you're going to have all sorts of interesting challenges, most of them people. <laughs> and I don't care what they say about me. I, I, they can attack me, do what, but you touch my bride. It's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> and the Lord's the same way. See, not all are the bride, but we all have been extended the courtesy of becoming. Revelations 19, verse 7 and 8. To her it was granted to become the bride. Process. Intimacy. Maturity. Totally given over to him. Still with me? By the way... In the Hebraic wedding ceremony, everybody that came into the wedding had to have a linen garment placed on, a white, white linen. Now, you might understand the parable. The man jumped over to, how did, friend, how did you get in here? Friend, how did you get in here? Where's that garment? Kick him outside. But the bride had four layers of fine linen, clean and bright, Revelations 19, 7, 8. Those four layers of fine linen were the righteous acts of the saints. You can only have righteous acts if you hear the voice of the bridegroom. Because anything that is good or evil, fleshly acts, you're the Lord of your life. To weave the garment, you must hear his voice and obey. Now, back in the year 2000, I was invited to go to uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, over the new year to, to minister in that. And um, while I was there, I began to seek the Lord about what he's saying for the new year. He said, I want you to study one word next year. I said, one word? Lord, you know that'll only take a couple weeks. He didn't say a word. He said one word. You know, he's done that with me all of my life. The first book I wrote, Promise of the Third Day, Third Day. Study that. 
Okay. Little did I know. Seventh day, little did I know. Everything starts with him saying, I want you to study one word or one phrase. And the depth of revelation and insight is beyond comprehension. You know, the Hebrews believe even today that each word, let me start it this way, each letter, word, scripture, has at least 70 layers of revelation that can be discovered. Now that's in this life. You're going to be discovering the word of God for eternity. I think the deepest I've gone is five, layer, five layers thick and touched on the six, but beyond that, it's way above my pay grade. It's got to come by revelation because my study is not going to approach the level that God calls us to. Why? Because my study, tree of knowledge. His revelation, tree of life. We can save that for later. And so this is what he told me to study, the word name. I said, name? Okay, so I got out my old Strong's Concordance. And every instance but two in the Old Covenant, name meant character, honor, and authority. Okay, simple. Then I took all those instances and I wrote them all down. That's how I study. In the New Covenant, in every instance but one, the word name means character and authority. And I wrote all those down and I said, okay. He said, now read the Bible. I'm not going to start way in Genesis. I'll start with Proverbs. Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. What does that mean? I don't know about you, but when I get a picture of a strong tower, it's not an abstract. I see these castles of old, you know, with this strong fortified tower, which is the metaphor, by the way. Then he said, now apply. Ah, the character of the Lord is a strong tower, a bastion of strength. The righteous are conformed to it and are safe. Oh, I got that, Lord. Hmm. The character of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous are conformed to it, and now they're safe. You know, did not Jesus say, I came in my Father's character? And then he said, no man can take my life. Nothing can thwart my destiny. Why? Because he was in that strong tower, the character of his father. Nothing could touch him. Hmm. That's interesting. Let's look at Genesis. I'll jump back there. Genesis 17, 5 says, speaking to Abram, the Lord, you know the story of Abram called out of Ur of the Chaldees. He's given them a promise. Your descendants will be as the dust of the ground and the stars of heaven. Hebrew says the sand of the, and the stars. Isn't that interesting? Everywhere Abram wandered, all those years, what did he see all day long? The promise. All night long, what did he see? The promise. In other words, the promise was so often in his face that reminded him of the covenant God had made with him that when he was well past the age and Sarah could no longer, he wasn't moved by the natural realm. He had the promise as his focus. That's why we build it into our spirit. Remember Peter and the disciples in the boat at night and this, the wind and the waves and it's stormy and here comes Jesus walking on the water. And they're like, well, it's a ghost. No. Well, if it was, it was holy. <laughs> he says, it is I. Don't be afraid. So you have visitation. He speaks. They have a revelation. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, bid me come. Most people think, oh, here goes Peter again. You know what Jesus did? He showed me this one time. He was so excited. Come on, Peter. The water's fine. Huge waves. 
Wind, hurricane force. The water's fine. Peter's just daft enough. He stepped out of the boat. See, you're never committed until you step out of the boat. Those other disciples are watching going, here we go again. Watch this. <laughs> Peter, you got to use some common sense. Keep the common sense. Get into the supernatural sense. The world's going to call you foolish no matter what you do, good, bad, or ugly. So remember, you have an audience of one. He had an audience of one. He's walking towards Jesus. He's doing great. And he says he began to notice the wind and the waves. And the moment he did, he began to sink. The moment you take your eyes off the promise, your decline begins. That's called the walk of faith. I see nothing. But what he said. That's how you overcome. That's why the enemy brings distraction non-stop. In everything you set your hand to, and in particular into your thought life. Distraction after distraction after distraction. So the Lord gave you tools. Second Corinthians 10, casting down imaginations. What does that mean? This floats in you. I cast you down. Get away from me in Jesus' name. Because that's the enemy trying to infiltrate. And every thought that acknowledges itself above the knowledge of God. God's word says do this. Well, this is what we do. I cast that down. I'm not doing that. Keep your tree of knowledge. I want to be led of the Spirit. And by the way, that's how you get to the place of focusing with intent and expectation. And your eyes are open and you now see him. Servant to friend. Friend to son. Son to bride. Focus on the Lord. Not for what he can give. For who he is. I, I, I'm going to tell you the honest truth. I... I I don't share this with too many. I mean, one-on-one -on -one maybe, but not. We've traveled many parts of the world and we've met some extremely influential and extremely wealthy people. And there was a time I would have laughed and said they had more money than God, but God doesn't need money, so it doesn't matter. But they're billionaires. And the Lord told me, don't you ever ask for anything. And they, after, you know, they're very insular because people are always there like this, especially American preachers. That's the truth. And so we would spend time with them and get to know them. And they say, after a while, they realized I'm not there with my hand. They said, well, if, if you need anything, just ask. And I think one time we did. We said, yeah, um, we want you to come to lunch with us. We're going to pay. <laughs> what? No, 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 no. Well, I've got, I said, no. No, no, I don't need what you have. You need what I have. Amen. They said, what is that? I said, a true friend. I don't care about your wealth and your money. We have great friendships. And they trust us and we never ask. We don't have to. Don't want to. Because they're not my source. Besides, if you've seen what I've seen, <laughs> all the wealth of the world is nothing. We, I, I used, one time, they, some friends came and picked Reshma up to take her to a women's meeting. And she got back and I looked out and went, hmm. She came in and I said, you realize what kind of car you were in? She said, no. I said, it was a Bentley. She said, so what does that mean? I said, it's a nice ride. Rolls Royce, Bentley, Lamborghini, Ferrari, all of them. And we go, oh, that's cool. I said, yeah, but I've ridden in a chariot of fire. <laughs> While I can appreciate the craftsmanship, it, it doesn't matter. We have to cultivate a kingdom mentality, not a worldly Amen. grasp Amen. for what the world has mentality. Is it okay to... Sure, it's okay, but keep it in perspective. Amen. Amen. So he's talking to Abram. He says, no longer shall your name be called Abram. No longer is your character Abram. But from now on, I'm going to call you, or your name, your character will be Abraham. The ha is a derivative of Yahweh. 
So he infused his character with Abram and he became Abraham. Well, that's interesting. Abram means exalted father. Look at me. Abraham, the infusion of character, father of a multitude. We're taking out the exalted. You're a servant. Pride, you've heard this, pride goes before a fall. If we had a picture of the two trees in the garden, life, knowledge and evil, good and evil, the trunk of this is pride. The trunk of this is humility. Hmm. He said, not only that, as for Sarai, your wife, she shall not call, you shall not call her character Sarai, but Sarah. Again, ah is a derivative of the name of the father. Sarai, princess. Sarah, princess of a multitude. She already had humility. Now she had promotion. There's no patriarch in the old covenant that ever fulfilled or finished their destiny without a change of character. I challenge you to study that. Saul remained Saul. Saul means sought after. Exalted. Remember Paul or Saul on the road to Damascus? Sought after, exalted one. After that encounter, he became Paul, which means little. Change of character. Change of character. The first Saul, no change of character, died. Character is the most foundational and important aspect of the Christian life that is so neglected for gifting and charisma that has caused the church to be the entity it is today. Void of the power and presence of God for the most part. Jesus himself went through the process of those four covenants. He laid down his deity and he submitted himself and came in the form of a servant. He was under tutors until the time appointed of the Father. Even at 12 years old, he had more knowledge and understanding of Scripture and and the Father, than all the wise guys. And I say that on purpose. And yet his parents said, no, now is not the time. So he submitted. Hmm. 30 years of character development for three and a half years of ministry. And we think, been to Bible college, got it. No, you're a bad accident looking for a place to happen. Character is intrinsic to fulfilling destiny. You see, when I first got saved, my dad, we got saved through my dad's affiliation with Full Gospel Businessmen. And I really liked that because I got to get involved. We pray for each other and, you know, do all the, all the stuff. But we'd have some people come through that would have a tremendous gifting and anointing. And they were profound in those things. And at first, you, we're all attracted to that. Like, wow, look... But what we don't understand is the vessel is un impure and unclean. See, your gifting as you practice in the gift God has invested in you, you can become very proficient in gifts. But that gift will carry you where your character can no longer sustain you. And that's why so many start out well, proficient in their gift, and they crash and burn at the end of their life. Because the foundation of character was not there. My prayer, even at that age, was, Lord, I want to finish well. If I have to make mistakes, let it be, but I want to finish well. Amen. Character is so important and so intrinsic to fulfillment of destiny. We go to Genesis 32. It's one of my favorites. Wrestling with God. Jacob at Jabbok. Jacob's name, his Character means heel catcher, supplanter, deceiver. Remember his story? There was a prophetic word over uh, 
his mother that the, the younger or the elder would serve the younger. So God had already prophesied this. It spoke in his destiny. But at some point, Mama and Jacob decide they're going to help God fulfill his destiny. Don't look at me like you're innocent. We all do this. I know what I'm called to. Get out of my way. Oops. Go ahead, run. And so that whole issue, you know, he ran off and he worked seven years for his wife and got deceived. So I had to work another seven years. And, but then he has a child born, a son, and he knows that son's going to carry on the prophetic destiny. Something shifts. Something of conviction came and he knows I've got to go back to my brother and make amends. I don't know if he's going to kill me or he's going to forgive me or he'll receive. I don't know, but I've got to go back. So the Lord was already working on him. And he comes to Jabbok, the fort of Jabbok, and he sent his family over. Let's see if he kills them first. Oh, that's not what that means. Okay. He didn't know. He honestly didn't know. And it says, there at night, the dark night of the soul, he wrestled with God. Now, isn't it interesting? Every time we look at the word, new seasons begin with darkness. New beginnings begin with darkness. It's always darkest before the new beginning. And people get to that point and they finally give up. I can't. And they miss. Look at the end of the age. Darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. But what's next? A thousand years. The glory of God. Darkness, darkness, darkness. And in this dark season, this is when we get to wrestle with God so he can change our character and we become who he said we are prophetically for the last 6,000 years. Amen. An end time generation filled with the power, the glory, the light of God that's going to change nations Amen. in the last great awakening. Amen. But that's struggle. It's struggle to get there because the enemy knows even though God's people don't and the enemy does everything to trip his pe God's people up. And unfortunately, they're unequipped or ill-equipped, I should say, to contend and break through. Why? Because we've majored on the minors. What do you mean? Character is the major. That's the only thing you're going to take to heaven with you. The character of Christ that's been formed in you. And that will also equate to your starting point in heaven, by the way. Because we're going to be continuing on for eternity. There, there's a process of growth there too. Well, we'll get there. Okay. So he's wrestling all night. I think I've shared this here before. But what he's saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And the first thing he blessed him with was a limp. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. <laughs> What does that mean? No longer can you rely upon your own strength and go your own direction. You must lean on me. He said, I'm still not going to let you go until you bless me. And he finally said, okay, what's your character? What's your name? See, here's why he answered, responded the way he did. Jabbok means to be poured forth and to become transparently empty. He was divested of his pride, arrogance, haughtiness, deceit, betrayal. He was empty. He said, I'm heel catcher, supplanter, deceiver. And this angel said, no more. From here on out, your name will be prince of God or one who rules as God, Israel. His character was changed so he could fulfill his destiny. Brokenness is not a curse. It's a blessing. Some of you have been through dark nights of the soul and you are say within yourself, why do I always have to go through this? You're fighting the wrong enemy. Embrace the process God is taking you through so you can become the man or woman of God he's called you to. Amen. How many of you like going to a dentist? It's always funny. Are you allergic to anything? Yes, dentists and needles. That's it. 
I started when I was 14. See, my dad had to have all his teeth pulled at age 36. Bad. I'm the only one in the family inherited that blessing. I didn't have all my teeth pulled, but so at 14. And I hate, you know, the thought is worse than the actual. And here comes this needle. And you're going, oh, my God. And it hurts worse. So every time I went, crowns, I, I, I mean, just on and on. So I had to have some dental work again. I'm like, okay. And I started, I thought, after all the Lord's brought me through, I said, Father, I thank you that you've blessed me that I can afford a dentist. I thank you, Lord, that you're going to guide his hands and my teeth will be fixed. I thank you for, for your love and your goodness and all that. And I went into that dentist chair and they did some work. I felt nothing. And I came out rejoicing. And the Lord said, I've been trying to teach you this for years. In everything, give thanks. It makes it much easier. So, I started applying that more often to my life. Oh, my back's killing me. Thank you, Father. I can even feel pain. Thank you, Lord, that this temple is being renewed. You know what? It goes. It's how you approach everything. Thank you for this test, Father. I'm about to have promotion. So your name, your character is now Israel, Prince of God, or one who rules as God. I like that. You know, the name... Bruce, there's no real definition for that one. <laughs> Closest they can come is dweller in the thicket. I said, yeah, I live in the bushes, okay. <laughs> Needle thorns. <laughs> the Lord began to show me some things, but I'll get there in a minute. So, Exodus 9, 16. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name, my character may be declared in all the earth. Wait a minute. Your character, your honor, and your authority be declared in all the earth. Notice he didn't say the signs, wonders, and miracles. The extraordinary manifestations, the prophetic words. Now he said, my character, honor, and authority may de be declared throughout the earth. We're in a season now where, just like in Acts chapter 4, people are being arrested for t speaking in the name of Jesus. Peter and John at the gate, beautiful, lame man from birth, healed, arrested. First thing they said when they were brought before the Pharisees, I can tell that you are ignorant and unlearned men. So you all qualify. Because <laughs> they were talking about the word. But I can also tell you've been with Jesus. Do we qualify? What was it in them that they could tell? Locked them up next day, beat them and said, don't you ever speak in that name again. So they went back to their group and said, we got to get out of this town. Now they pray for more boldness. Isn't that funny? Peter, who had a change of character through brokenness, when he met the resurrected Christ, he was different. All of them. And the Lord said, Peter, keep your mouth shut and just walk down the street. I'm going to show you something. And it says everywhere the shadow of Peter touched, people would lay others in the street and they'd be instantly healed. Well, when it says his shadow, that doesn't mean shadow is what we consider shadow. It literally means the inward deposit of the spirit glory of God, that outward effluence, wherever it expanded to, anybody that came within that purview was instantly touched and healed. Character. 
You see, we're in an hour. You don't have to say a word. If you understand who you are and Christ's character within you, you can just step into any arena and all of a sudden everything shifts. It's not you looking out going, don't go there. That's ah, new age, devil, devil, devil. No, the devil's going, I hope they don't come here. They're afraid of you. Hmm. It says in Leviticus 22, 32, you shall not profane my holy character, name, character. Hmm. But I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And again, we've made a formula out of this. Don't say that word in that manner. Now, we shouldn't say those things, but it's a principle. Priests were to be separated from all ungodly customs. Are you kings and priests? Okay, they were to live pure and blameless lives that honored God and followed his plans. Failure to do so would profane the name of their God. Anything you do based upon the tree of the knowledge of good and evil profanes the name of God in your life. How then should we live? Father, what are you saying today? What should I do? How do I respond? I've done this before. This is easy. Go ahead and do it on your own then. We profane the name of the Lord when we become Lord of our own life. Hmm. Now let's look at some a new, a renewed covenant. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your character and authority. Don't profane that. How do I profane that? I don't live according to the standard of his character. I can't live according to the standard of his character until he has worked in me the process of character development till I come to the place of brokenness and transformation that I can be like him. The world is desperately in need of true sons and daughters, daughters of God today that don't just talk a good talk, but live a light life. Amen. A light life. That wherever they go, the light of the glory of God is evident. They don't even have to speak. And listen, Isaiah 60 verse 1 and on through is happening today. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Multitudes will come from vast distances just to be in your presence because of the light of the glory of God. The mission field's coming to us in this hour. Because in the midst of a generation of darkness and gross darkness on the people, when you're light, it attracts. We've got to stop being chameleons in the world. We're to be lights in the world. Not through always speaking, but through just being in his image, his character. I come in my father's name, character. It gets even better. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied with your character? Cast out demons in your character and authority and done many signs and wonders with your character and authority? He'll say, depart from me. I don't know you. Why? Because you used a formula apart from a submission and a Christ-like character. You exercised a gift apart from submission. And it's a dead work. Treat the knowledge of good and evil. I can't tell you how many times Reshma and I in our travels around the world were shocked and grieved by things we heard and even saw. Because others would come through and minister, but they'd always had a price tag. Right. Five-star hotel. Guarantee of this amount of money, whether I speak or not. This type of water, this type. It's putrid. 
It's disgusting. And that, depart from me. I don't know you. That's no, there's no character of Christ in that. Are you in a business or are you in a calling? Are they your source or is God your source? Broke our hearts to the extent people would come up to us all the time with envelopes of money. Could you pray for me? Could you give me a prophetic word? Take your money and leave. I am not your soothsayer. I want nothing to do with this. And I had this teach very strongly for a lot of years in certain nations. You know the worst one? We run from conference to conference, meeting to meeting, wanting to receive words to do that. And what do we do? We put them in a spiritual. How do I want to say? I got to be careful. Trophy case. Yeah, I got a word. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, what did you do with the very first one? Well, let's see. It's right up there. Do you know, it says of Joseph, before the word of the Lord came to pass, that word tested him. You know the foolishness of asking for a prophetic word? You might as well say, Lord, throw me in the fire a little bit so I can learn some things. If God wants to speak to you, let God speak to you. Or manipulation. I've told people plenty of times, all over the world. If I had a word for you, I'd give it to you. So don't come up here asking for a word. Well, they come up and say, uh, the Lord wanted me to, he told me to go up and have you pray for me. I said, oh, really? Okay. What, what for? Yeah, well, whatever God shows you, get the phone out and click. I said, okay, Father, help him. Manipulation. God have mercy on us. I can go to him myself. One of my dear friends, our dear friends, said, you know, we're not seeing people healed and touched the way we used to. And it's grieving. We're, we're going to take some time off and just see God. I said, don't do that. That's God doing that. He's weaning people away from having to lean or draw upon another man or woman so that they learn to trust in him. Yes. Keep teaching the word. Yes. And watch what happens. Matthew 12, 21 says, and in his name, in his character and authority, Gentiles will trust. Isn't it interesting? Nowhere does it say in his word. Now, I'm a, I love the word of God. But do you understand what I'm, the principle? In his character. When they see the difference between true believers and a false gospel, they're going to know the truth. Thank you, Jesus. Whoever receives one little child like this in my character receives me. Hmm. Matthew 18, 5. Now here's one that'll... And I love the fact of what this place has become. Not only a place of equipping and developing in Christ-like character, but a place of prayer and intercession. Listen. For where two or three are gathered together in my character, there I am in the midst. Wait a minute. You mean it's the, not the magic formula? In the name of Jesus. No, no, no. That's why so many ask and don't receive because they ask and they want to consume it upon their own lusts. But where the character of Christ is, God instantly responds to that because he sees his son. And you're trusted. And so when we gather together in the character of Christ, especially in one accord, done. And when you get to that point, you don't have to see a manifestation instantly before you because you know it's done because you have his character. Hallelujah. Character, 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 character. 
Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Back to them in the character, honor, and authority of the Father. What would happen if we actually believed the word? Somebody, okay, you're going to accept Christ. Here's what's going to happen. All your sins are going to be washed away. Every disease is going to be healed. You're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Your spiritual eyes and ears are going to be open. And you're going to, you're going to be a renewed, a, a new creation. Okay? And then they accept Christ and it's done. That's not theory. We've challenged and watched as that's been exactly because if their expectation is that, that's what they receive. But religion says, no, you got to do this. Now you got this next step and you got this next step and you got, I'm not against foundational teaching. We need that. Joe's one of the best foundational teachers I know. But do you understand you bring them in with an expectation. Now, now that they've got the package, build the foundation and keep going. Here's another one. Bible colleges, if we can call that anymore. First, you've got to be able to teach Christ from the Old Covenant. And then before you begin your ministry, you've got to go and fast for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. That's, how, that's, the, that's the pattern Jesus gave us. Oh, I've got to be looking for a job. Pastor, I'm prophet profound now. I've been to Bible college. Can you... Put me on staff. Go fast and pray. John 5, 43 says, I have come in my father's character and you do not receive me. But if another comes in their own character, you receive them. Yes. Why? Because we want the, the glitter. We want the wow factor. Because character is not always flamboyant. It's eternal. It's supernatural. Father, glorify your name. Father, glorify your character in me. That day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father with my character, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing with Christ-like character. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. Can I tell you, there's, on the whole, there's more doubt and unbelief in the church than in the world. There's such a lack of understanding of the Word of God and the God of the Word. Did not, but does not the Word say He supplies all your needs? Doesn't it say, why are you concerned about all these things? Look at the lilies and look at the birds. Don't, don't you know you're of more value than that? My father, because of covenant, you're in the family, even the servants. The prodigal said, eat better and live better. And we go to hell, oh, what am I going to do? Where's faith in that? Father, I thank you. You supply my every need. Healing. Healing. You know, I was injured in the army in 1989 with my back and my wrist. I had an operation on my wrist and my back, and I immediately grabbed hold of the Word of God. By His stripes, I was healed. That's it. Through 30 years of pain, that was my anchor. I don't care what this temple says, I am healed. I would spend hours teaching in agony. Nobody knew it. Because I'm healed and I won't receive this. And finally, three years ago, four years ago now, just before Christmas, I'm sitting watching uh, Sid Roth and somebody came on. He said, the Lord showed me there's backs out there. People are going to be healed. I said, oh, good, Lord, heal them. Because I'm healed. <laughs> it was done for me. And the Lord, and that person said, okay, everybody that needs their back touch, stand up. And I'm just sitting there, and the Lord said, you, stand up. I went, okay. So I stood up, and his presence came in that room. Now, I'm not demonstrative. You know, I don't flop for the sake of flopping. 
courtesy. And I began to weep. His presence was so strong. And when that person prayed, all of a sudden, every pain in my body left. And the Lord said, son, when were you healed? I said, the moment I took hold of your word. He said, yes, but let me show you something even more profound. I was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. When were you healed? See, every provision for your life before he even initiated this realm was already provided for. Why then would I panic and go, oh no, what am I going to do? It's done. Thank you, Father. How about this? I don't know what time you finish, but... At the name, at the character of Jesus, every knee will bow. And every tongue confess he is Lord. Remember on the island of Gennesaret, the bolt pulled up, Jesus stepped out, and the demoniac ran and fell at his feet. He didn't say a word. Why did that happen? Because the character of the Father just arrived. I'll get this. Some of you have been longing to see signs, wonders, and miracles become who you're called to be, and those, that's going to be natural. Spontaneity is going to take place wherever you walk. Boom. Healings. Deliverances. It's kind of fun watching deliverances happen, and people are going, what's going on? It's okay. It's the Lord. We saw that on a Zoom meeting a couple days ago teaching a little bit. I saw an angel standing behind a guy sitting in there. Started speaking to him. He started manifesting and he was set free. I didn't say, come out, come out. No, I just shared what God said and he was set free. This has got to become something that is an anchor in your life. A foundation of your life. Character, character, character. Amen or oh no? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.17. Character. Again, we think it's name, 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 name. Do you know the name of Jesus is used in places where God is not found? Apostasy. Ichabod is written on the church. The Spirit of God is left, but they still use the formula because it makes them look religious and holy. He's nowhere there. It's not a formula. It's a principle. And the principle is Christ-like character. And let's raise the bar. The character of the Father. Because Jesus said, what I do, you should do also. He came to point to the Father so that you could have the character of the Father and minister with the love of the Father and see the results of the Father everywhere you go. Because when you're under authority, you don't do your own thing to make yourself look like something. You do exactly what he says, and it's done. That's why at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus healed one. He was the great healer. He could have cleared the house. But all he did, the Father told him to do. That's how it works. Oh. I'll give you one last one. In... in, Hebrew culture, you know, the word says you have a new name written down in glory. That's when the fullness, fullness, fullness of who you really are is manifested. We can touch upon it here. We can go quite the distance here. But there's a a stone with a new name written on it that only you and your father know. And it's a white stone. Why would it be a white stone? I'm glad you asked Because in judicial processes in in, in those days, they would use stones to signify what the verdict was. If somebody was guilty, they would get this black stone. If somebody was da-da-da, they'd get a gray stone. But if they were innocent, pure, clean, they'd get a white stone. And it speaks of a process you've gone through judicially that says, no, you're pure and clean. 
No dishonesty, no corruption. And the only reason you and God alone knows that name that's on there, because there's no way you can communicate to anybody every nuance of every moment of your life that brought you through this process to become who you are. You can't define that. All you can do is allow it to be revealed. Only the Father knows. And so many times when you go to heaven, he speaks your true name and you instantly know it. I got a new name. Amen. Not somebody who plays in the weeds. <laughs> you have a new name. And the Lord's in the process of bringing you into that fullness in this life. So you're prepared for the vastness of the next life. So you see, there's no special people in this. There's an opportunity for everybody. It's extended to every single human being. We've all been given the exact same measure of faith at the new birth. Little faith is non-persevering faith. Great faith is persevering faith. That's what it means in the Aramaic. Are you a quitter? Or are you holding on and saying, absolutely not, like Jacob and Jabbok? That's the choice you get to make. Father, you're so good. 